perspective, I think, is our values, how we examine our objective world in our own opinions and our own recognition systems. So either way, it can be economics, it can be business, it can be psychology, and it can be physics and stuff like that. So, but there is one person in the history of philosophy or in the history of, of our world who inten intentionally broke this kind of recognition schema that we perceive the world, which a metaphor would be like, I think he kind of breaks the merit that we perceive this world. And that person is David Hume. So what is Hume's question? Hume's question have raised such a sensation in the philosophical field at the time. As an empiricist, Hume denied the casuality, which is A causes B and B causes C, this kind of chain reaction. He denies that in his view of the world. And this question is so sensational to Kant, another philosopher that we are hopefully uh, familiar with in a future maybe, uh, made it, that Kant himself made the negation of Hume's proposition that he's one of his most important goals in his career of philosophy. And so what is empiricism at all that Hume has believed in? It is kind of the belief that experiences and our observations of the world are only the way that we can obtain our knowledge. And this is kind of a very good uh, TOK question that uh, maybe some of you can write about in the future, but not, I'm not going to write about it. It's too complicated. Um, so the represented figures in empiricism in Britain is George Berkeley, David Hume, and the famous Gramot. So before we actually talk about empiricism, is, there is a contrary point of view, which is rationalist. It's kind of led by the continental Europe who lives in the, mainly in the mainland Europe. It's kind of, I think, their, geograph their geography and their living styles that really make them to believe that there is a reason behind everything in this world. It's kind of like, it's kind of like very interesting because how you live actually determines how you perceive the world. So French René Picard and the German Leibniz and the Dutch Spinoza in that era, they believe that reason is our only source of reliable knowledge. While feeling that experience proposed by Hume is kind of unreliable, and they hope to use a more rational system, for example, mathematics and hard sciences to examine uh, our observations of the world. So, before we actually tend to Hume, we still need to discuss another very interesting question uh, in the field of science, which is the problem of induction. So what is induction? For example, I'm a philosopher who specializes on certain swans, and this is kind of a very interesting, uh, this very famous example. So, so far I have found that all the swans in the world are white, but can I make, the negative, can I make this uh, statement that all the swans in the world are white? Not necessarily. Because if there is one black in the future that I observe, then this incident will undermine all my before suppositions and all my before observations very easily. And this problem is kind of like um, easy to grasp but hard to explain. Because if we see an apple fall from the tree and we conclude that Newton gains his knowledge from that phenomenon and derives a very complex mathematical and physical equation to solve that problem, then we cannot see that in the future, like every time when an apple starts to be like mature and it will fall off the tree. For example, if there's a wind or something that will flow up to the sky, so we cannot deny the future possibilities of something happening not in the way that we propose. And this is what Hume proposes in a more uh, in a simpler way. So what kind of more complex version of theory that Hume has put forward? First of all, Hume like Berkeley, he believes that all of our sensory impressions can only come from various sensible properties. And we do not physically feel anything except what we see, what we feel, and what we can literally touch with our hand or see with our eyes. So for example, if I hit myself very hard, like very harshly, for example, with this microphone, I brutally hit my head, then I'll feel a great surge of pain. But is this great surge of pain actually the, uh, the, re the result of my hit? Not necessarily, they may only happen simultaneously which renders them a kind of illusionary correlation instead of a true casuality. 
And so we would just naturally think that in all the experiments in the past, hitting myself would cause my pain. But we have already questioned the method of induction using the example of white and black spawn above. So King pointed out that after humans have passed observations, like observing, I pointed myself, like I, I hit myself so many times that always also pain, that we, I will naturally derive the conclusion that if I hit myself, I'll go pain. But this conclusion is not necessarily true because the psychological reinforcement of me believing that this is true actually caused three um, characteristics in my psychological level, which is succession, contact, and inevitability. Yes, we know that after hitting ourselves with the pain, and after pain in it, after meals of time even, we came to see the conclusion that this pain is actually caused by the hitting. But do we actually know this? Why won't there be a failed experiment in the future? So has this problem actually been solved by philosophy area, like even till today? Um, I feel like Kant's solution to it is um, not that valid, but we will have three solutions to it uh, following. So the first method proposed by Kant is the transcendental philosophy. Kant is a German, so his philosophy is kind of naturally influenced by the tra transcendental ideas of how realism can be perceived. Kant discovered that the fundamentals of natural sciences was destroyed by Hume because, Hume because if we cannot make A causes B, then B causes C, then all the physics, all the even economics, even businesses, all the theories proposed will be kind of undermined. So Kant proposed that. Um, so in a way, he actually changed our perspectives in doing this stuff because traditionally in philosophy, we kind of separate uh, the thing that we observe in ourselves because those are not uh, because we always separate mind. Uh, separate our mind and body, which is the thing that I see and the, and the, and the very being of myself. But Kant proposed that the mind that is our subject also plays an active role in we doing the world. So it's kind of a metaphor like, you're not seeing the mirror, you're using your eyes to see the mirror. That is, the mirror isn't just a mirror. The effect that you see is a combination of your sensory uh, sense, your eyes, and the physical um, effects of the mirror. So it's kind of like a combination. So another example to this is kind of like, Kant is proposing that we have a priori knowledge before we start to perceive things. Um, psychology students may be familiar with this concept. It's called schema. So if we walk into a very dark, a very black uh, field, and we see two people on, on an arena punching each other. And if we do not have the schema of, oh, this is actually a boxing tournament, then we will perceive that this act of punching each other is kind of brutal, it's very brutal. A person punches another person to blood. Then there is people yelling at, great job. Then it's kind of weird, isn't it? But we have the schema of, there's this, this, this is a bo boxing tournament, then this schema has led to us believe that this is acceptable in our daily lives because it's kind of entertaining, you know? So another example, which is very important to kind of understanding this, uh, this statement, Professor Silva gave another example. A traffic policeman reported a car accident to his officer, and the police officer naturally replies, um, so tell me about it. And the policeman said, so where did it happen? When did it happen? How did it happen? And if the, uh, and if the um, policeman replied, um, nowhere, no one, no cars, no human, then this cannot be a supposition that there is an accident. So our schema tells us if there is an accident, there has to be a car, there has to be a person, two people maybe, um, then there has to be cars bumping each other, at each other. And this is kind of how schema works. And another example, which is the law of contradiction, is that if I say that this piano is black, then all of us know that that it is not white or it is not green, right? 
And if I say someone is kind of sick, then that necessarily means that that person is not healthy. So this natural way of law of contradiction seems to suggest, seems to support Kant's point that there's something that we see in this world that is internal inside of our brain, inside of our mind. So actually, we're, when we're seeing things, we're not only using a mirror, we're actually using our senses as well at the same time. So this is Kant's solution to Hume's problem, meaning that casual, casuality is not external. It's something inside of us. It's something that helps us to comprehend our natural world. And this is kind of, like, to me personally, it's not that valid, but here we have a second solution. So in modern philosophy of science, give another solution to this. We have a law of induction. One of them is that if there's enough experiments in the past to show that if I jump out off the building, then I'll fall to the ground, then there's kind of seems kind of stupid and kind of unnecessary to assume that that won't happen. So this is the law of kind of induction turning into a test of probability, which I think is not that valid as well. And another uh, solution to this, which is the last solution, is Professor Hawking's experience. And this method basically uses the principle of Occam's razor, which is that if we can find a model that meets our empirical observations and it's simpler and more accurate than all the other explanations in this world, then we can regard all the other um, situations and simply take this because why to make our lives harder, right? Um, so with the above three solutions, Kant's view, Professor Hawkins' view, and uh, the modern philosophy of science view, we kind of really have solved Hume's problem. But as we um, grow older and as you probably will do all of your theoretical questions, we have to um, rethink, is there any casualty in this world? But we can temporarily believe that there is to better understand gravitational law and stuff like that. So to make our life easier, here's the three solutions to Hume's problem. And using the metaphor again, we can temporarily say that we kind of reshape the mirrors that Hume has challenged and broken in front of our eyes. And yeah, so that's the way how we make our life better, by believing in one of the three, three solutions, or you can be an empiricist like me. So I think that's all, thank you.